Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session in the ABLE 2021 conference program. We are at 1.01 p.m. Pacific time, 3.01 uh, Central time, 4.01 Eastern time. And if you're in another part of the world, you're going to have to use timeanddate.com or just tell me what time it is. But you're here because we are going to hear from folks at Auburn University about inequities in learners' professional identities. How can ePortfolios bridge the gap? Um, for those people who are interested, the live transcript option is on. So you can just go down to your toolbar in Zoom and click the live transcript button and choose show transcript. I will now hand the talking stick over to Autumn, Annie, and Laylee. And um, we encourage everyone to participate because this is a conversation session uh, and we're excited to have everyone here. All right, well, welcome once again from the three of us. Um, we appreciate all of you coming here today and for participating in this conversation session. Again, we're going to be talking about inequities in learners' professional identities. How can ePortfolios bridge the gap? And this is facilitated and created by myself, Annie Small, and Dr. Laylee Miron. Um, and I do want to just direct your attention to the Obby link at the bottom, where we will have um, a shared document for um, the questions that we will be discussing later on and a link to this presentation if anybody would like these materials. And Laylee has dropped that link into the chat. And Laylee, if you'll go to the next slide. So uh, most of you are probably familiar with Zoom already, but just to be sure, um, in the bottom left, you are gonna see the unmute and the start video icons, and you can select those to either turn your mic on or off or to have your camera on and off. And you can do whatever you're comfortable with, but please mute yourself when not speaking to reduce the background noise. Um, you also see the chat icon toward the center of the screen at the bottom. And um, you can use those to type in any questions or comments. Um, and if you prefer to, of course, speak aloud, you can always unmute. And then again, if you need the transcripts, you can turn those on or off with the CC icon. And you can also use this tool to change the caption size. And then there are the reactions icon to communicate non-verbally. And you can select things like the smiley faces or thumbs up, um, whatever your desired symbol is. So now we're gonna go over our agenda very quickly. Um, we're gonna start out with doing some introductions. And then Laylee will cover our conceptual framework. I will go over um, Auburn's ePortfolio curriculum and Annie will take us through observations from Auburn and our discussion activities. So we're gonna start with our icebreaker or rather our introductions and let's get to know each other. So if you will, whether you would prefer to comment in the chat or to unmute yourself, um, we are going to do our name, our institution and job title. And what is something that makes you feel happy, confident or motivated? There's no pressure to answer all three, um, but you are free to do so if you're interested. So for me, my name is Autumn Frederick. I'm from Auburn University and I'm a graduate program assistant at University Writing. And I think something that kind of motivates me is adapting this idea of having a growth mindset because I tend to want to uh, accomplish things and make them happen now when really things take time to grow and develop. And so I remind myself of that phrase so that I don't push myself too hard too fast and give myself the grace to grow and change. And I will just do this popcorn style and I'll pop it over to Laylee and let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Laylee Moreau. I am a program administrator with University Writing at Auburn. And I think this is a great prompt. One thing that I've been enjoying lately is watching all of the hummingbirds come to the feeder on my back porch. They are lovely animals um, that live very fast lives and I've just been intrigued, kind of entranced watching them.
and popcorn, right? <laughs> I'll bounce it over to our co-presenter, Annie. Hey everyone, um, I'm Annie. I am also a graduate program assistant at Auburn University for university writing, like Autumn. Um, and something that makes me happy is just spending time with people that I love. Um, so I am going to popcorn it over to Ryan, but also feel free to put something in the chat if you don't want to unmute and talk. Yeah, no worries. I'll I'll unmute and talk. Uh, I'm Ryan Witt, uh, director of first year seminar and the writing center at the College of Idaho in beautiful Caldwell, Idaho. If you think of the state of Idaho as being kind of a boot, we're kind of near the ankle. Um, one thing that kind of makes me feel happy, I don't know about confident or motivated, but it does make me sometimes want to kind of, you know, Get a little shimmy in my stuff is my shoes. I don't know if I can get them on camera here, but these are my Doc Martens that I've had for a while. Yes, I like my Doc Martens. I wear them a lot. So thank you. Uh, popcorn. Let's see here. I'm getting a lot of stuff in the chat, so I'm not sure if anybody. Kevin, have you gone yet? Let's go to Kevin. Hey everybody, I'm Kevin Kelly. I teach at San Francisco State University as a lecturer faculty member. And I like Laylee put in the chat that hummingbirds are uh, amazing creatures. Uh, we have created a backyard for bees and hummingbirds because we keep bees as well. And it's just awesome to watch them go around and sometimes um, as a completely separate thing that makes me happy, uh, really good food. <laughs> And for the popcorn, I will go with um, Carly. Okie, okie doke. Um, I put it in the chat, but I'll go ahead and unmute and say it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Carly. I'm from the University of Florida. I am the coordinator for the Office of Global Learning. And my happy, um, something that makes me happy is uh, getting to spend time with my dog. So that's my happiness. Um, I will choose popcorn style, Amy. Hi, um, I'm uh, also at Auburn University with the talented team that is presenting right now. Uh, I'm associate director in their office. And we have had a week of rain, but today there is sunshine coming through my window and that makes me very, very happy. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it to uh, Victoria. Hi everyone, my name is Victoria. I'm from Salt Lake Community College and um, I'm an e-portfolio specialist here and makeup makes me feel confident. Um, I will pass it to Aaron. I don't know if you've gone yet, but I'll pass it to you. Thanks. Um, I'm Aaron Gallion at the University of Arizona here in Tucson. And uh, I work in our Center for Teaching and Learning as a professor of practice and co-coordinator for our certificate in college teaching. And social and emotional learning makes me happy. And I will pass it to... Uh, let's see, Steve. Uh, yes, I'm Steve Fox from uh, IUPUI, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. And I just love walking in our neighborhood, uh, especially in the summer. And I'll pass it to uh, Jillian. Hi, I'm Jillian, and I'm from Kwantlen Polytechnic University here in, um, in Canada, um, BC, and I am a faculty member who originates in the academic and career preparation faculty teaching English upgrading, but I'm currently um, on loan to uh, the Teaching and Learning Commons as a educational consultant for learning design assessment. And I just uh, received a new portfolio of ePortfolio Advancement. 
And I love the sunshine and spending time with my dog who just finished undergoing surgery. So very happy to have him home. <laughs> and I'm just looking to see who needs to be past the baton here. <laughs> um, let's see, I think, I think everybody's gone. Oh, Jennifer, I'm passing to Jennifer, my homie. <laughs> Oh, hi. I'm sorry I came in a little late. Um, I'm Jennifer Mahoney. I actually work with Steve uh, at IUPUI. He is, he is my boss and uh, a really good one. Um, and uh, something that makes me happy. Um, I, I love um, listening to my husband and my two children perform music. Um, they're, they're all very musically inclined. I am, I am not, but I am an avid audience member. And has everybody else gone? I'm not sure who was keeping track. I think Nina may be the only one who has not. Okay, Nina. Hi. Usually I just stay quiet in the corner, but I'm enjoying this, so <laughs> call attention to myself. Um, I'm Nina. I'm at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Um, I'm an educational developer. I work in the Teaching and Learning Services Office. I support experiential learning on campus, and there's all kinds of things that are kind of brewing, so I'm excited to hear what uh, we're talking about today. And like many of you, I like watching puppies play. I like taking walks. I live very close to the Ottawa River, so I tend to take a lot of walks outside there. That's it. Awesome. Well, it is great to get to know all of you, and I'm going to turn it over to Laylee to learn about our conceptual framework. Hi, everyone. So, as Autumn said, I'm going to be presenting briefly on our conceptual framework. And we first wanted to talk about the context that we're coming from. Uh, later on in this presentation, after we've done that contextualizing, we'll open up the floor to discussion. So as you've heard, the three of us who are presenting today work for university writing at Auburn University. And Auburn is a large public institution in the state of Alabama in the United States with more than 30,000 undergraduate and graduate students. So we're going to be speaking from the context of post-secondary education, specifically coming from a large public institution. Preparing students for careers is a primary goal of post-secondary education. Yet the critical thinking, independent problem solving, and proactive communication that workers need to apply in skilled positions are not always a major component of the college classroom. From my own experience, before joining Auburn, I taught first year composition and technical writing at Penn State University. For many of my first year students, their composition class with me was the only one in which they weren't sitting in a lecture hall with hundreds of other students. My technical writing students who were juniors and seniors often told me that they hadn't had to write anything since their first year composition class several years before. The vast majority of their curriculum was exam-based. While my observations from Penn State are of course limited in scope, they do point toward the prevalence of a mass production model of education in which students move through a standardized curriculum expected to absorb knowledge without having many opportunities to reflect, critique, or create. ePortfolios, as one of 11 high impact practices identified by the American Association of Colleges and Universities, are intended to counteract this problem of passive learning. They join other forms of active learning, such as internships and undergraduate research, that support student retention and engagement. Students often prepare them with an audience of potential employers in mind. And in fact, 70% of employers say that they look up applicants online. Yeah, it's an open secret that to actually land a job, it's not always what you know, but who you know. It's estimated that between 50 and 80% of jobs are filled through personal and professional connections. That's a big equity problem because the size and strength of our networks 
is very influenced by the life situation we were born into. Students of affluent and educated parents are more likely to have ready-made professional mentors and to get their foot in the door at good jobs, benefiting from their family status and connections. This reality makes it hard for students from less educated, poorer backgrounds to compete. The point here isn't that students' post-graduation outcomes are all predetermined by their backgrounds, but that higher ed institutions need to put resources towards ensuring all students can build their networks and identities as professionals. Supporting widespread implementation of ePortfolios is a step in the right direction since ePortfolios require students to reflect on how their past achievements connect to their future goals. When a professor, advisor, or administrator guides a student through the process of curating, reflecting, analyzing, and communicating about their experiences, that is a moment of professional mentoring, which especially when done with students from less privileged backgrounds can help bridge the gap in career preparation. Yet, the question of how to best help students through this important process is not as simple as it may seem. My colleagues Autumn Frederick and Annie Small will speak to you about a curriculum developed at Auburn by University Writing and some challenges that curriculum has encountered. We share these experiences with the understanding that they correspond with the bigger question of equity in professional identities and networks, and to establish a context for the questions we'll be posing during the discussion portion. All right, so I'm going to talk about our ePortfolio curriculum. And so University Writing hosts a number of workshops uh, series, one of which was the ePortfolio Student Workshop Series. So what was the ePortfolio Student Workshop Series? Historically, this series was a six-week program that met once a week with the intent of walking participants through the process of developing a professional website, aka an e-portfolio um, that was supposed to showcase their skills, experiences, and learning with diverse artifacts and reflective writing. What was the process? Our workshops operated on a flipped classroom model, allowing ample time for activities and e-portfolio building. Before each workshop, our participants uh, completed short readings or video assignments and, uh, accompanied with note-taking sheets. Our workshops involved recapping the information from the pre-assignments as well as facilitating discussions and activities around those topics. And we also provided worksheets and informative handouts um, during all of the sessions so participants had personal copies of our resources to take with them. What did it cover? The workshops covered the pros and cons of the three platforms we supported, which were Wix, Weebly, and WordPress. It covered personal brand statements, purpose and audience, organization, design principles, artifacts, accessibility, and reflective writing. So let's talk about what the rewards were. Having a professional portfolio that students could leverage to enter graduate programs or gain employment was a reward in and of itself. But another reward was the opportunity to earn an award. Um, University Writing has the Outstanding ePortfolio Award, which recognizes exceptional ePortfolios created by Auburn University students. And it's a motivating factor for our students to complete the process of creating an ePortfolio. Our winners receive a trophy and finalists receive a certificate. We normally would have um, like a ceremony, but the pandemic has kind of put a pause on that for now. Um, and a final reward is the potential feature on our website. Um, as we revamp our website's ePortfolios examples page, we sift through these winners and finalists to select new ePortfolios to display. And this feature is another instance of professional recognition and a way to promote traffic to their pages as well. And of relevance to today's conversation, one of our requirements to win and be featured is strong reflective writing skills. So reflective writing provides students the opportunity to articulate the importance of an experience, what they learned and how they plan to utilize those skills in the future. Reflection is a valuable and challenging experience for our registrants. 
However, participants have the tendency to just summarize things. So we're constantly working to find ways to support them through the reflective writing process. For instance, during the workshop, we provide participants with handouts that ask guiding questions to aid them in reflective thinking and writing. So let's look at the questions we use to guide our workshop participants. When sparking reflective writing in participants, we help them consider the what, so what, and now what. First, we address the what. What context slash background information is relevant to their audience? What happened? What did you do? What were the results? Second, we tackle the so what. How does this skill, experience, or knowledge matter? What insights did you gain? How does this relate to your education, career aspirations, personal interests? What did you learn about yourself, your goals, values, or perceptions, your environment, subject matter, or community? How does this connect to other skills, experiences, or knowledge? What skills did you use or acquire? What challenges did you encounter? How did you overcome them? What part are you most proud of? Why? What would you do differently? How is your experience different from what you expected? Finally, we explore the now what. How might you use this skill, experience, or knowledge in future projects or endeavors? How will this influence the way you approach future projects or endeavors? What will change as a result of this? And what would you like to learn more about? Providing participants with time to practice these skills is vital. One of the ways we do this for reflective writing is by asking participants to select, summarize, reflect, and connect. Utilizing a worksheet, um, participants are asked to select an artifact they wish to reflect upon, summarize the skill or experience the artifact represents, reflect on the experience using the sheet of what, so what, and now what questions, and think about how their artifacts connect to the entirety of their ePortfolio's brand and message. We believe it's important to facilitate opportunities to learn and practice reflective writing skills because of the students' struggles with the process, which leads us to think they aren't getting this experience elsewhere. Further, we believe time to practice reflection is another issue of inequity because it assumes that all students have the same academic experience. For example, if reflection is not provided in class, many populations may not have the time or the resources to initiate in reflection. Some students help care for their family members at home or they work multiple jobs that operate as barriers to access. Ensuring that our resources are offered during workshops, curated as open education resources online, and brought to the attention of faculty to utilize in the classroom are three of the ways that we try to bridge the equity gap and eliminate reflective challenges. And our colleague Annie is going to discuss more about our observations of struggles and successes during the ePortfolio Student Workshop Series. Yeah, so during my time at University Writing, I have facilitated or co-facilitated with Autumn two ePortfolio Student Workshop Series. One of these series was in person and the other was following a high flex model. Um, throughout both of these series, in person or high flex, I have observed both some struggles and successes that different students have experienced. So the main struggle that students have seemed to face within ePortfolios is simply being able to reflect on their experiences. While students are able to offer artifacts and discuss what they did, oftentimes they're not able to reflect on their experience, such as discussing why they took part in the experience, what they've learned about themselves during this experience, and how this experience will help them in the future. During my time reflecting on working with these students, I realized that some would share a career that they dreamed about, um, but they wouldn't know a lot about it. And then they would rely on their artifacts and achievements to inform the audience about them. Now, my observation with students struggling with reflection does not pertain to every student, leading to the question of what are factors playing into this struggle? So through my own college experience, I noticed that many college courses are taking tests and writing research papers. I have been asked to regurgitate information over and over again 
instead of reflecting on the information and how that actually applies to me and how I can use it. Undergrad taught me a very certain way of studying that leads to success, and that way did not involve reflection. Now, this being said, it does not apply to every course, every professor, and every student, but just a large theme that I found throughout my own college experience. Overall, undergraduate students are used to being told how to achieve success in college, but not beyond. I did not start thinking about my career until about the end of junior year. And even then, it was kind of just like an idea, a concept, and I didn't put much effort into learning about that career. So I knew generally what I wanted, but no details about it. So those are three years in which I could have been developing my professional identity and understanding my classwork and how it would help me in the career that were just gone. I was just focused on passing my classes and taking tests. Now, when being asked during the series to reflect on experiences, um, thinking about a future career or a job, students are generally just unsure on how to do this. Like taking tests or writing research papers, they give information without reflection, just expecting the information to speak for itself. Students who struggled for, who took our series for a class seemed to struggle even more as that grading aspect came into play. So I think with these students, they focused more on getting that grade in the class um, for their e-portfolio and found it hard to look past that grading aspect to reflect on their professional identity. Now, on the other hand, we did have students who had set career goals and internships they wanted to apply for. These students had been able to take their previous experiences and really discuss how they've grown from the experience and how it relates to their future. Even beyond reflective writing, they've worked to show within their e-portfolio who they are, such as making the conscious choice to include pronouns or being very particular about their design choice. The e-portfolio series guided students in their reflection by asking them to narrow down to a target audience and ideally their future career. Students' plans and knowledge of their future goals then play into the struggle of reflection. So students who are very unsure of their next steps seem to find it hard to answer questions about why they chose certain experiences or what they've learned from the experience. Now a difference between these students who struggle to reflect and the students I've previously discussed who were able to reflect is their degree program. Um, I noticed that those who were unable to reflect were often undergraduate students and those who were able to reflect were graduate students. So graduate students are working towards a very specific career. They've entered a certain program for that career. They can easily then identify their target audience within the career. While some undergraduate students might have a specific career in mind, a large number don't. Undergraduate students then might not have a specific audience in mind or are creating their e-portfolio for a professor, not a, um, thinking about their professional identity. So overall, this isn't helping with their reflective writing. Because of this lack of audience, students are finding themselves unable to offer specifics within reflection and try to keep their e-portfolio broader which overall kind of just ends up without being able to reflect. As Lately pointed out, e-portfolios are meant to counteract passive learning and start students in developing their professional identity. However, um, within e-portfolios, students, particularly undergraduate students, are still facing a large gap to navigate. So, we have shared our curriculum and our observations kind of with the successes and struggles that students face and we wanted to start our conversation piece with uh, after sharing this um, and autumn has shared the link again to um, the notes which we talked about earlier in this session Lely will be um, transcribing conversation so that you have these points to take when you leave the session. So we're going to go ahead and 
talk about our first question. So I'm curious if you've created your own ePortfolio or taught an ePortfolio project to others. What are some challenges that you observed with reflecting on experiences and linking them to an audience? Yeah, the audience seems to be like that is directing a large part of their ePortfolio. And so not having that audience lead to a lot of struggles. I think Carly has her hand raised. Uh, yeah, I wanted to share um, a challenge I've had with students um, with audience specifically is that our the way we do ePortfolios is um, it's an extracurricular program. So we kind of have some guidelines, um, but sometimes those guidelines don't always match up with what the student might actually want to use it for audience wise. So um, they sometimes get some mixed messages on like what's professional, but then when their audience is like in a creative field, like um, more video based and, and that kind of design based, then they, they um, end up having some conflict because they're not sure which way to really go. So that's one of the challenges I've had. Yes, and that hearing you, say that um, makes me think about some questions that one or two students who I've worked with previously have talked about, like asking me, kind of expecting an answer point blank of like, where's the line drawn? Like, where do I find the balance between like, I am like trying to show myself and show this creative side, but also this is supposed to be professional. So there's a, definitely a struggle with that. And there's no like specific answer within that that we can give. Um, because it, I think it pertains to every student. Yeah, again, Amy, it seems like moving past the college environment, university environments, um, and knowing how to show yourself to the public. Ryan. Yeah, I appreciate this um, conversation. So thank you for the ideas. Um, I think one of the things that I have, a, maybe I, I'm going to answer the question with a question um, and, and maybe just a comment. But I think that the, the question back is kind of, you know, what kinds of portfolios, e-portfolios are we thinking about when we ask this question? Because if we're thinking about kind of that polished outward facing portfolio for business or employment or however you want to classify it, whatever stakeholders, that might be one set of audience. And that's complicated enough, right? Like just, just to, you know, think about that kind of morphous. I mean, you feel like you should have a handle on what that audience thinks and would look like. I think it, it may be deceptive because I think many students coming out of their, you know, undergraduate, especially graduate students, maybe more so a little bit more solid kind of, you know, sense, sense of audience as you kind of suggested um, you know, have that idea. Um, although I think that even slips out for me a little bit as you kind of try to define that audience. But then when you're starting to think about portfolios as those messy kind of collections, right? The like the learning portfolio, which I think we're kind of gravitating toward on our campus as we implement it, although we kind of want to have it both ways, which is a whole other conversation. But I think that's the question I, I, I would ask back is like, okay, so if we're thinking about these as, let's just do, think of for a minute, not just about the outward facing, but the inward facing or the kind of learning portfolios, who is the audience for that? Is it the student? Like, so, so are you the audience, your own audience of your own e-portfolio? And if so, what does that do to your desire to want to write and think about the, <laughs> those reflections? Because again, it's like, well, if I'm just writing for me, what's the point in like, I already know what I think, therefore, why do I have to go to all this trouble of <laughs> to detail my learning? Um, at the same time, you know, it's, it's more complicated than that. And that, I guess, I'm just kind of throwing that out there is like, who is the audience if it's a messy portfolio that's meant to be kind of more of a process of learning, not a necessarily just a demonstration of learning, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting point because we keep it so broad of like, 
letting them choose their audience, but then everything else is like, depending if it's for themselves or for like the professional audience, we're still keeping everything that we're showing the same. And so that might make it as kind of you're suggesting, like it's different depending on your audience. So that kind of I think would make it harder for them to think of well, what kind of reflective writing or what's the purpose. And then when they do like show their work, they might not have that reflective writing, which is like what, I mean, we notice they don't have it, but it's not for that reason. That's an interesting point. Nina has her hand raised as well. Nina. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I thought I'd add to that. I think, Ryan, that's a good point. And the previous point about creative kind of expressions, um, tying those two together, what I've seen um, just from my own experience as a grad student in applied linguistics and writing studies is that um, reflective writing is not a genre until it becomes one, basically. Um, so in, grads, in grad courses, especially, or anywhere where you've got kind of the seminar structure, if you've got any opportunities for students to work together on their portfolios or to swap portfolios and give and get feedback. I think what you'd find very quickly is that there's a convergence in terms of the structure or format of the reflective writing pieces, which can be, which can be a bonus for, for assessment purposes because you can maybe more easily create like rubrics for it or give more um, uh, applicable feedback, I guess, on the broader scale. Um, but again, going back to that idea of creativity and audience, if you want the students to find their own audience and if finding that audience in a creative um, expressive way is in itself part of the learning, then I think as an instructor, you've kind of got your work cut out for you in terms of designing meaningful prompts, structuring the development, structuring your feedback and support so that students don't find themselves converging on a particular format or style of expression. Mm -hmm. um, like, I just think that it, it raises a lot of questions in terms of what you as the instructor are hoping that students um, get out of it in relation to your course specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, like going back and see that like this is a, like a series or trying to have like reach a lot of students at once or like on our curriculum it was to reach a lot of students at once. But again, like bringing back the point that like Nina and Ryan said like that creativity everyone has like a different avenue that they're going down. Um, and how can you, it's kind of hard to like mass address all of that. Yeah, kind of answering Steve's comment about the first year students targeting a potential employer might be too hard. I agree. I think at that point, it's very hard to ask them to um, try to think of their career and we actually haven't had a lot of first year students in our take our series. I believe, I think it's typically more sophomores and up, but Autumn, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if that's the way that we had advertised it, that freshman students are overwhelmed by the idea or think it's not for them yet. It is open to everyone, but um... And I don't know what, what it looked like in the past, but in the year that we've been doing the series, I will agree with you, it's been more older undergraduates and graduate students. Yeah, and Jillian's point, reflective writing can be very risky, make students feel vulnerable. That like reflection part that makes it feel like you have to be like, I think someone else said it like very feely, like showing all of yourself. Um, so that can be scary to think about. And also balancing how much you're showing your, of yourself to if you want a professional audience. So like, there's so many things to navigate. Sorry to jump in, I just wanted to follow up. I, I um, in my teaching with students, I do kind of a progressive reflection throughout the course. I have at least three, one in the beginning, one in the middle, one in the end. And it really is worth it to see how much more comfortable they become with the reflection at the end. But it is, it is a very awkward experience. And I, I know I feel that as well when I'm writing. Um, you know, if I'm writing for me or an audience that I know, it's different than when I'm trying to compose for um, people I don't know. Like how much are you willing to risk of yourself? And especially today in the digital age where things just don't go away. Um, 
you know, the digital literacy, the privacy, all that stuff has to be embedded along with that reflective writing. And I think the writing piece is something that just has to be, has to be taught in itself, in and of itself, because so that they get comfortable and, and um, skilled at knowing when and what and how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hearing you talk about that um, just reminds me, I'm in a counseling program, so we do so much reflection. And the first semester that I had to do reflections, I didn't know how to do it because I was like, this is too, like, I'm giving too much information away. And it just was very uncomfortable. But as like to Jillian's point, like the more that you do it, the more that you get used to it, you're able to measure. I think I was able to measure what exactly I need to be like sharing that's enough, but not too much. And again, I think that just comes with like the practice and point that I kind of made that in college, I didn't have that practice. Um, I was, when I would write paper, it'd be a research paper. So I would just look at a bunch of articles, find the point and share it. It wasn't like reflecting on my own experience. And I wouldn't say I'm extremely comfortable reflecting now, um, almost a year into my program, but I'm more used to it and I know more how to do it. Balancing it with academic writing can be really difficult and um, kind of counterintuitive, I think, to a lot of students. But in the end, it actually teaches them critical thinking and how to not just regurgitate what they're reading in, in those articles, but actually to think about it and to make connections. So, yeah, it, it is really worth it in the long run. I think that's a good point just about the opportunity to kind of develop these skills, which is probably um, a good segue into our next question. So have you noticed inequities in how well students are equipped to engage in reflection as they create e-portfolios? So more generally, have you observed or considered any other inequities related to professional identity building? And then we have two kind of sub prompts. Um, if you have observed this, do you have a prompt or teaching strategy to help with this reflective process? Has, how has it worked and would you be willing to share it? And also more generally, how would you bridge the gap in available opportunities for professional identity building for people from different backgrounds? Um, and this is a lot of questions, so feel free to answer any part that you can. <laughs> so the three W's that um, modeled earlier works really well. I think that Autumn, you had talked about that. Um, yeah, I, um, my answer was kind of long, so I thought I'd just go ahead and say it rather than try to type that out. But um, I teach a, a course that has a number of high impact practices, um, and it does culminate in a portfolio, although not in the same way that we're kind of talking about it um, in this conference. But our campus is an urban campus. And so, you know, we have a, a lot of different demographics coming in. And so I have seen some inequities. And one of the things I love about the particular course that I teach is we do a collaborative service project and the students get to choose who they work with. And they also get to choose the um, proposal and so what often ends up happening is those students who maybe don't have the same advantages of community connection or you know, knowing you know, the right people in certain organizations or businesses, um, they can connect with classmates who do have some of those connections and advantages and then they all, you know, collaborate and work together. And so it's like a, it's, it's a really nice kind of leveling out at an, at a higher level. And I have to always kind of reassure the students at the beginning of the project, because so many students just hate group projects and they hate the whole idea. And I totally get it, but I had to reassure them that 
hey, you know, what usually happens is, you know, these, these students will bring you with them. Um, and they kind of, you know, are able to bring everyone along for the ride, which is um, just super helpful. And it usually happens really nicely and organically, which I love. I'm always sure it's not going to work. And somehow or other, every semester it works. It's a really great program to have. And that, like, again, kind of like I said, like leveling the, the playing fields, um, just like another way to share your resources that you have and students who are taking part in this might not realize that that's initially what they're doing, but it's just like that big community. That's, that's really great. Um, and then I know something I wanna talk about. Oh, Carly said that a gap is internship experiences with students who can't afford to take unpaid internships um, and then have to take work jobs that are unrelated to their field of study. And this is something that Autumn and I have talked about quite a bit um, with the um, unpaid internships because, yeah, as you said, like some students cannot afford to take those unpaid internships. Um, so they, they don't have that experience, that great experience that other students might have and that's giving the other students like a boost in their field. Um, and then also like working jobs that are unrelated to their field they might not want to include that within their e-portfolio because they initially might not see how that relates at all to their field of um, study. And um, Autumn and Carly, who also shared this, I don't know if you want to talk about that anymore. Well, I know that one thing that we had actually talked about this um, this week <laughs> during prep for um, the conference and you know, like you said, some students are um, working multiple jobs, like we talked about in my section, that can kind of prevent them from having the opportunities and the time to engage in these um, practices. And sometimes those jobs may be relevant and sometimes they may not be to what they want to do. But when it comes time to do internships, which of course are a requirement, so they will be relevant if they're supposed to be unpaid, student might have to leave that job, which is helping, you know, helping them survive, helping them pay their bills and buy food and everything. And, you know, that's just another kind of symptom of the inequity around, um, I guess, higher education in general. But um, that's why we were talking about how we didn't like the language around internships because we we're having to do them. And they're like, you know, they, they don't have to be paid. And we're saying, well, it would be nice if they were though, because some students need them to be. And if you're asking them to give that up, it could be, you know, the difference between um, whether they eat or whether they can pay their rent. And we already see issues of students being hungry and homeless and, and things like that. Jennifer, I see your hands raised. Um, oh, I think that was just from earlier. I'll, I'll undo that, sorry. Okay. Just making sure. No, I'm good. Um, and then Carly and Amy also talked about how some students express feeling of being behind their peers and then unvalued and kind of like Amy said that imposter syndrome. And I feel like that also kind of goes along with like not being able to have like an internship, like they don't have those experiences and then they may see themselves as less than, or again, not have like a job that relates because they are trying to just like provide like the food for the table um, and have that like college experience, that college degree. Um, but when they see that other students are getting these great internships and can afford to take the internships, yeah, they may feel like less than, and the, there's the imposter syndrome and then reflecting within their e-portfolio, like they, again, might not want to include their experiences or maybe have a habit of kind of just like shutting down when they have to think, reflect on their own experiences and start comparing it with other experiences that other people are having. Before we move on to the next question, just seeing if anyone has anything else. I wonder if students could interview each other about their experiences and draw out reflective thinking that way. 
I feel like in some, in my personal opinion, some people that could work well. And again, others might, again, depending on their experiences, might not want to partake in that, especially if it's more like an interview setting. But that could be a fun activity to get students to just start talking and again, get others' opinions on reflection. Okay, so the third question we have is, have you tried promoting ePortfolios beyond your own program or teaching? And what methods have you used for this promotion, especially to make sure the message is reaching learners from underrepresented groups? Hey, um, yeah, I, I, this is a great question. And, and to be honest with you, I think there's a lot <laughs> to it. Um, I, and and I, I'm actually not entirely sure. This is something as we roll out on our campus, I think we're gonna have to really think a lot about. But one of the things that this question actually sparked for me is a little bit of a tangent. So I apologize, but I kind of want to throw this out in part because it's related, I think, to the overall kind of concept that we're dealing with here um, in regard to, to inequity and e-portfolios. Um, it kind of reminds me of, of, a, of a brief story. Um, one of my colleagues here on this campus um, was talking with me about um, a student of ours who um, actually as part of his kind of business, there's, there's like a business proposal competition that runs in the state among the institutions of higher ed. And the, the team from our college this year won first place and it was the first time they'd ever done that. But one of the key components, one of the key members of that team was a young man, um, he's an international student who has applied over and over for a variety of different internships and has never gotten them in part because the application materials essentially just require like a CV and a cover letter and sometimes just a CV. And, the, and this in, individual had not gotten a lot of coaching on their CV and the CV itself, I think, had a little bit in terms of a lot of different dynamics, a, lo a lot left to be desired in terms of the kind of uh, message that this individual was kind of communicating about their professional skills and, and skill sets and preparation. Um, and one of the things that, although this individual, when you get them in the room and they start talking and they get to the interview, this person is, you know, wowing folks. And it makes me wonder if, and, and this is complicated because it comes with race, it comes with um, class, it comes with um, unconscious and unconscious bias, but it makes me wonder to, and I want to kind of throw this out to you folks as well as to the group, is there a way that e-portfolios, especially those outer facing ones, have the possibility of taking folks from these kind of marginalized communities. And because they're able to tell the stories of these individuals, they help to ameliorate some of those biases. Or do we see these e-portfolios working kind of in the opposite way to the extent of like some of the research around, um, you know, resumes that have been kind of like coded with, you know, typically white names, quote unquote, and typically black names, and how the folks with the resume, excuse me, the materials with typically, you know, black names don't get called back in the same kind of rate. I'm wondering if we think of e-portfolios as being potentially an ameliorative kind of capacity to try to tell the stories of these individuals to get them kind of more, you know, their kind of foot seat in the door a little bit more, or if it's not something, I don't know if this is something you folks have been experiencing or not, and I hope I don't take it too far afield on this question, but this is something that I, that I, that I think this kind of brings up as well, so I'd wondered if you'd folks have thought about that or had any experiences relevant to that as well. Um, let's see, could I see what others are saying before I respond? Um, collaboration. Um, so I think that e-portfolios could potentially be a great way to kind of get beyond that bias again, because it's really showcasing who they are. Like resumes and CVs are like resumes to be like one page, um, very black and white. This is what your experience versus e-portfolios are able to offer more of a like a holistic view of that individual depending on what they decide to like include within it. And so I feel like they could be a great way for the individual to show um, all of the experiences really show like what's important to them. Um, so again, it's looking beyond saying this is what I did, but like these are all the incredible experiences I had. This is what I've learned from this environment. Um, these are some things that I have um, are like really important to me. 
And so I think it could be a good way to kind of get beyond that bias that is often having within like hiring um, or even like entering into grad school, things like that. So I think that it could, but also do you want to say that I realized that e-portfolios, there's kind of a in professional, there's like certain ways that you are supposed to represent yourself in the e-portfolio. So there is that big barrier um, with that, like telling people what they have to include also. Mm. Amy makes a good point too, that could also perpetuate more implicit bias. Um, that is very true as well. So we only have a few more minutes. So I think at this point, Laylee, do we want to kind of summarize and kind of end? Yeah, so I don't think we'll have time to get to our fourth question, but this share document is still available. I've been trying to collect the conversation that's been happening. Um, and I wanna thank everyone for the really great thoughtful contribution. So hopefully this document can serve as a reference um, and a source of ideas as we all work on our ePortfolio uh, implementations. And just to quickly wrap up, uh, our slides are available via a link at the top of that shared document. Um, so I won't read over all the references, but they are here. And there is citation information as well. Um, and again, I wanna thank you all so much for attending and participating. Um, it's been great being in conversation with you and it looks like Kevin has dropped uh, a feedback link in the chat. So it'd be great if, if you all could uh, give some suggestions, some thoughts on how this conversation went. Thanks again, everyone. Absolutely. And thanks to the three of you, Autumn, Annie, and Laylee, for putting together this discussion, this conversation session, and we appreciate it. And as you mentioned, it was rich. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it expands in that document. And we have the Slack channel as well for folks who want to continue the conversation. Um, we do have some birds of a feather sessions coming up at, uh, at the next couple minutes if people have time and are interested. And we do have, uh, because I know we touched on uh, things that could be questions for students. We have a student panel today at 5 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Central. Uh, so please show up and ask students how they feel about um, the inequities or the potential inequities, the potential biases, um, as well as um, the potential benefits and, and power of ePortfolios. Amy brings up an Auburn student will be uh, participating as well. And I think you're right. Uh, someone corrected me. It is um, 4 p.m. Pacific and 6 p.m. Central. Thank you for that correction. I've seen the quote war eagle, but I know Auburn's uh, mascot is a tiger. So I'm confused. Somebody's going to have to help me out. We have an eagle too. So. I see. <laughs> it's a long story, but overall we have an eagle. So we chant war eagle. <laughs> well, instead of the fighting war eagle, maybe it's the writing war eagle. Yeah. Boom. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I'm going to close the uh, recording. Mm -hmm.